about that. I'm talking about pockets where they can genuinely talk about Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, unedited, um, with their life, you know. You know how pagans talk. I mean, I've been to Pink Elephant, so I know how pagans talk. And willing to share um, their struggles, their hardships, um, their apprehension about giving their life to Christ. And what I believe that why this is so important and why these pockets of connectivity or these pockets of events are so important is because um, it really challenges them to live a full 180 life. And it's not like, okay, I want to give my life whole, uh, live my give my life now and walk a half-hearted Christian life. But they know, they know what it takes. They know what it means to live a Christian life. And they know what to give up and what to surrender and what it means when Christ is living within them. And that's what I want to do. And what I say, and why I say it's on the verge is because it's going to be a continual conversation, an ongoing conversation for these atheists, these maybe even homosexuals, even just even unchurched people to know about Christ. So it starts with something simple as, you know, at the guy, as you could say, just going on one Sunday service, experiencing Christ, and then talking to their friends, going to a small event, you know, eating, you know, buffet food. And then in a divine moment, he feels goosebumps and he realizes that God is really alive. And he realizes that the life that he's living isn't worth it. And he wants to live a life fully devoted and surrendered to Christ. That he would even bring people, you know, that has never known Christ before. And he, you know, it's strange because that guy that I know, he, he doesn't even, he didn't even really declare that he accepted Christ. But he's forcing his friends to come. That's what, that's the type of people that I want to reach. That's the type of people that I want to bring to 180 Church. And what's interesting and why we call it the web is because, um, like a spider, when they create a web, they use their own protein, you know, their own silk to create a, a spider web to, you know, catch um, their prey. And in the same way, I want this, <laughs> sorry, to catch their own prey. So I want, um, what I want this thing to be is an organic um, event, an organic conversation. It creates uh, on its own and it builds life on its own and captures these atheists, these non-believers and you know having an encounter with Christ and catching them and having God blast them so they live a full 180 life <coughs> and that's what I hope to do and it's interesting because in one of my small groups this guy um, I won't you know tell names but you know he's a unchurched mother effer <laughs> and I mean he's like you know he's known as the party guy I mean he's worse than me like I worked at Pink Elephant but this guy he does Pink Elephant if you know what I mean. And he's known to be the party animal. And within eight weeks of coming to this church, he came from being speculative about Jesus Christ to surrendering and giving all of that up. And it's been so, it's been so Come on, crazy. give a hand for that. That's, that's awesome. It's been so weird. Um, and it's been so life-changing that the people around him think he's emo. <laughs> right? He thinks he's emo because of that. And it's because the very power of Christ. And now... Um, he has the potential and the ability to network with those people. And his roommate is actually a, Jew, a Jewish white man, um, a nominal Jew. And because we have small groups at their house, he hears the conversations that we're talking about. And why this friend of his who's been partying two years in his life gives up his Friday nights to talk about God. Now he's curious about what we do. And he's actually, as you can say, on the verge. Right of encountering in a conversation with Christ. Now, think about, think about it this way. Imagine if we start making these pockets of communities and imagine if we start um, creating these events where your friends, not your, not your friends that are Christian, but your friends that have not known Christ, you know, doing fashion lines, doing um, whatever, like bowling or even something simple as that or even doing something spectacular as um, creating like college events where you're on church friends come in and they experience oh maybe this is what God is like I never knew that before and imagine if those friends actually encounter Christ and imagine what kind of people they would bring the, the people that we can never network on our own like me I would I would have never thought to reach a Jewish nominal Jew but because of one guy that experienced Christ his network his web or his verge 
brings another person, connects another person to possibly bring in Christ. And that's what we aim to do. So think, of, think about that. Imagine the possibilities. This whole Verge thing is about the potential of what uh, Christianity and what 180 Church could be like and the extension of how big and how wide we could reach. And that's what On the Verge is about. Amen. All right. Let's pray for it. How many times you practice that? That's good. On the Verge. Yo, I screwed up once, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's all stand and pray together. Come on. God, we want to pray for Pastor Billy. We thank you, that God, that you've, you've given him a knack and a gift for connecting. And maybe Pink Elephant was a prophetic declaration of how in God's house there will be an immense party that will be lines at the door of people wanting to come in. Father, I want to pray that in every Christian, every follower of Jesus Christ in 180 Church, everyone that has surrendered their life to him completely, I pray that Pastor Billy will be able to equip our body for every single person in this room to say, where are your friends with God right now? And then we would all be able to say, they're on the verge of coming to know Jesus Christ and his power and love. We pray that would become a dream and a reality today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm not biased, but this is definitely my favorite pastor at 180 Church, and it's not because she's my wife, maybe half of it, but uh, she plays a very important role here at 180 Church. First of all, in 2009, we're, and you remember, 180 Church 100% believes in woman equality, amen? amen? Woman equality does not subject women or are biased to any type of position in the church. Whether it's even a senior pastor role or an elder role, whatever role it is, we believe that the Bible teaches very clearly that men and women are not just genderly equal, they are positionally equal. We're feminists at heart. And uh, 2009 will be a year where we empower, you know, a lot of women that have been coming to our church, ladies that have been coming to our church, will be be given the time and opportunities and investment that they haven't received before. We're going to make it a priority to make all these dumb guys go back in the line. And we're going to make it very, 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 uh, you know, a central meaning of 180 Church to raise up women leaders for the next year so that many other women in New York and here in Staten Island can see that women are just as called as men. Amen? And this is what Pastor Lydia embodies and this is who she is. All of them in one, X-Men. She plays many different roles spiritually. So she's going to come up and talk about spiritual life in the house of prayer and whatever God leads us to talk about. Here we go, honey. Nice. You want to sit there? You could sit there, honey. Okay. No, it's okay. I'll sit here. But this is on your face. Can I sit here? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm more comfortable this way. But I um, just want everyone to know <laughs> that the other pastors got time to prepare. So they have notes, but I don't. So just kidding. Um, what would you like to, me to share? Share about um, your heart for how everyone here will grow spiritually and how to be spiritually alert, learn how to pray, and all that kind of stuff. Because, uh, before she goes, let me just give you an illustration. Pastor Lydia is very much like Jean Grey because she senses everything. Like, you know, when, we preached, uh, when I preached the uh, spiritual slumber message, a lot of people are in spiritual slumber. Some of you guys woke up, huh? You guys are more alert today. Like, yeah, we heard that one. But uh, she would get things like, you know, we believe in prophecy at 180 Church. Amen, right? We believe God speaks. And uh, Pastor Lydia has this spider sense Jean Grey ability to sense danger. So she kept seeing 911 like 11 times. It would drive someone crazy. So she has these spiritual senses, and it's almost like a prophetic alarm to any church and how she wants to help people grow in alertness and discernment of how to follow God and sense and pray and all that kind of stuff. So that's what she's going to share. 
your heart? Um, I guess in one line, I have a heart for people to draw near to the heart of God, um, for non-believers to, you know, meet God, but really for believers. There are so many believers that came to encounter Christ as their Savior, but lack in relationship with Him, and they have no idea how to connect with the God that saved them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I have a heart for people to um, really, I guess, believe and really have the relationship with God that they always wanted. And um, so that's my heart. I, I think that's my calling um, for this lifetime on earth, like, till I die. And um, so I guess, um, what more is there to say <laughs> than that? Um, so we have the house of prayer, right? I guess just a few things. Um, we have the house of prayer. So how the house of prayer began was the staff members actually used to gather at evals, which is staff meeting, um, and we would pray, sometimes for hours, sometimes for two. And then um, at, that, at the same point, um, I was also... I was online looking at this website for House of Prayer because it's always been on my heart, like this thing, House of Prayer, where people come and pray and all that stuff. And as I was on the website, um, on the left corner of the website, it was a House of Prayer in Kansas City. Some of, my, some of you guys might know what that is, right? I don't know. On the left side, um, I saw in gray and black, House of Prayer, International House of Prayer, All Nations Church. And that's when we were still called the All Nations Church. So I saw that on my left. First it wasn't there, and then it was there, and I saw that, and I thought that, honestly, House of Prayer in Kansas City have this, um, have this desire to have other people start House of Prayers in their churches. So I actually thought that it was some special computer program that when you log in, somehow they know what church you go to, and it pops up, you know? Like, how does that sound, you know? Kind of like, don't you like, hey, you should start that thing. And, <laughs> but at the same time, like, um, in, I, in, my, in my heart I knew, and also literally I knew that was not a program. But it was actually, um, you guys all used to Supernatural, right? <laughs> it was actually a Supernatural sign of what God was saying to start the House of Prayer in Staten Island. And just um, to, I guess, give you an intro of what, where that comes from, the reason why I had a heart for House of Prayer was that a um, long time ago in college, um, someone I had not known came to speak at, at Nia College and um, prophetically spoke over me that I had the heart of David. And he asked me, do you play the piano? Complete stranger. And I said, yes, I do. And he said, you have the heart of David. And then he said to me, he said, you know what? You're not going to understand what this means now. But one of these days, God will raise you up for the restoration of the house of Jerusalem. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? And for seven years, I searched, what does that mean? What does that mean? I even looked up. Anytime I heard Jerusalem on the news, I looked it up to find some meaning. But that day, on, this, on the same website, as I saw that, um, I also looked up, like, okay, how's the prayer? And then I, I was reminded of that prophecy. And I looked up, and it, they actually had information there that they had just put up, and it basically said that the restoration of, house of, uh, restoration of the house of Jerusalem was the house of God that Solomon would, would build in his time so that God's presence would be returned there and for, for others to pray 24-7 and praise the Lord, right? So basically that's what it was. So from these two-hour um, prayer meetings that we used to have, you know, you could do something, like, because it's the right thing to do for a long time, but when God touches it, when God says, okay, do this, and you obey, even in heart, even if you continue to do the same thing, when you step out of what you're doing and say, yes, Lord, because you know God's initiating something, and you turn to God and you say yes, and you start doing it, you see tremendous fruit in anything that you're doing. And basically that's what happened. We were praying two, three hours. Sometimes the staff people would get very bitter at me, probably, because <laughs> they were like, praying again, praying again. But at this moment, when God said, it's time, and this is what you've been called for, 
start the house of prayer. And then Pastor Kim, um, Pastor Kim actually, see, I'm a little slow. Although I'm sensory, I'm very slow sometimes. And um, we were just praying, and we're just going at it, praying for God's heart and all that stuff. And Pastor Sam, he doesn't like to pray, so he would not be at those meetings. So he would leave us to pray, and he came out of his office, and he said, okay, it's time to start the house of prayer. And it was a timely confirmation. So we stopped, and we basically, from that day on, started the very international house of prayer, All Nations Church. And it's interesting. We changed to 180, but we used to be All Nations Church. And God spoke to us exactly where we were at, All Nations Church. So since then, we started asking God, because it's so easy to pray. Am I going too long? No. Oh. Um, it's so easy to pray, God, you know, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, and then you do what you know, right? It's so easy to do ministry the way that you know. Like, let's save soul, let's do it this way, let's do it the way Paul did it, let's do it the way Peter did it. But God has a way that he wants to use every single one of us, not led by Paul in the past, but led by the Spirit of God. And basically, that's what God started at the house of prayer. It gave us the very place to really seek him and say, God, and, and really um, in a posture and see, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do? Father, what are you saying? So we all started listening, and we started seeking. And from there, a great revival happened where um, people actually started being born again. You know, people, people who've been going to church and coming to All Nations Church started getting born again. We heard of salvation stories here and there. I didn't know that I was, born, I was not born again, and people would just become born again, and all this stuff. And from there, all these other things, 180 Church, the, the heart of 180, what that means, all of that stuff, it came. So we, we still meet now. On Saturday, we staff meets House of Prayer at Evals, and then we meet on Saturdays with the members. First hour, we meet to just talk to the Lord and what he is saying. And you know what? Not everybody knows what's going on, but the heart of the heart of the Father is as you make room for him to come and listen to him, he wants to speak and you and people begin to hear God's voice and begin to sense what God is saying in the first hour. And it's be, by a show of hands, who started hearing God's direction or sensing God's presence in the house of prayer? Yeah, a lot of people actually. It began a very deep relationship from God, father to the child. And then a uh, second hour, we asked the Lord, Father, what are you doing? And we intercede. Instead of God, we want to pray for revival in this in USA. We ask, Lord, what are you saying? And we get pictures of what God is doing. We get we get illust illustrations, we get prophetic words, and we basically go exactly by what God is saying and we do it. And we trust it, and there's tremendous fruit. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that I do. Um, we saw, as we were praying about the house of prayer, we saw a vision. I think Pastor Billy saw a vision, and a couple other people have. But they saw a vision while we were praying. Of uh, There was a house of prayer in Manhattan, and it was 24 hours. And it was Friday night, and we saw a bunch of people, young people, like dressed up in club clothes, say, um, where are you going? They said, we're going to the house of prayer. And people were like, what? And, and this, this radical vision about the house of prayer is, first of all, I'm the last pastor to start a house of prayer. I am not focused enough to be praying 24 hours a day. Okay? Me, I have to go off on my own and talk to God, you know, myself. And I hear his voice, hear it very clearly. But there is, there is this power that's unleashed in the house of prayer and getting to know the Lord in this way. And we believe that's part of something that God's going to do. Unleash the power of God through this. So if you haven't been in the house of prayer, join us there. So let's pray for Pastor Lydia. She was like, look, there's a new X-Men cropped in right here. Look at Father, we want to pray for uh, Pastor Lydia. We want to pray, God, that We just want to thank her for being the ears and the eyes and the guardian of our church spiritually, like an eagle praying and seeing the danger and the schemes of the enemy and being a woman, God, that, that can rise up and defile the sexism in our culture and be able to represent strength and power and really be a symbol of authority to many other women that will be risen up in this age, God. We want to pray that, God, your anointing and power will come powerfully through her as she speaks in this church. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Please be seated.
I feel like, if you've ever been to a Catholic church, I feel like today we're like, like a mess. <laughs> in Catholicism, you're like, up, down, up, down. <laughs> so, hey, why not, right? <laughs> One last time. Okay, lastly, I'll do me. And, and sort of my new role at 180 Church here. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I'm not balding, and I am almost crippled. So, you know, and uh, uh, my whole idea and story about 180 Church before ANC is the most unlikely story of me actually being here in Staten Island, because I'm originally from Manhattan. And um, Staten Island is the most exciting place, of course, you can live. And I own a home here, and, and God sent me here on purpose. But let me just tell you honestly from the shepherd's heart, from, the, from my heart to your heart, let me tell you, the last five years, I must admit, been the most difficult five years of my life. It was ego-crushing, um, heart-aching, heart-breaking, betrayal ridden um, used and left betrayed and left I mean starting this thing was perhaps the most difficult thing anyone could do in their life and the question that remained in my heart for a long time was God why because you know my story, ident I identify a lot. Well, I love Star Trek. He's in the next generation, too. But um, as Xavier, is because he believes in this crazy radical vision in the story of X-Men. How many people know the story? Say amen. Come on, let's not originate. Say amen. Amen? You know, you know the story. He has this um, crazy radical vision for helping gifted people use their ability for the good of the world, Right? But it's his own people and the people outside of those people that persecute him and saying that he shouldn't do that. People should use their own ability to achieve their own success in their own way of climbing the ladder. And even the people that he mentors and he, and he, you know, he helps and invests in betray him too at times and question why he does what he does. And I feel like a lot of times in my life I feel just like him at the story of why should we believe in a church 100% funded by young people. And let me tell you the story of why 180 Church started and why God told me to start this church. Let me, first of all, 180 Church, God said, before I had many different offers from California, I mean, offering packages of hundreds of thousands of dollars, I mean, $100,000, eight, and you know, one church offered me a wife and a car, and you know, you need, and, and said, here's a number to a prophet, the prophet's going to tell you that God's going to do an amazing move with you in California. He wants you to move to L.A. right now. And that's like, word? Yeah, that's a nice offer. And, and, and there was a, a other international Christian leaders flying into New York, offering me positions. And I said, God, this is the position, and similar to Pastor Joe, this is the position, this is my ticket out of hell. This is my ticket out of the dump. And God whispered, no. I want you to pioneer a movement. My like, God, what movement? <laughs> There's four people here. They all have quarters. No money whatsoever. They, they give quarters. I have a dollar. I, and back then, and you can't even get gas with a dollar. I'm like, God, what? no, God goes, don't leave to the Midwest. Don't leave to where other, there's other Christians. I want you to start. And pioneer, and it will be very hard, but I want you to pioneer something that does not exist here. And I said, hell no. And by God beating me down into submission. And let me tell you, the most painful thing about being the pastor of one in the church is all the Christians around Staten Island. Every church in Staten Island offered me a job, including ICC. Uh, and, and, and some churches were mad at me for not taking their job. Why? Because you know, why you have to start your own thing? I go, well, I'm just trying to... So I get persecuted for obeying God, right? For giving up positions, in other words. And they go, no, no, you're just an egotistical little young man. What the hell do you think you're trying to do here? I'm just like, elder? Old man? I mean, I mean, you know, I mean... I mean, please, I mean, I'm trying to obey God here. I'm like a lamb here being crucified. Why are you persecuting me? And you know what? 
I realized at 2008 why God let me spend five years in purgatory, pay my penance for my maybe ego, ambition, I don't know, uh, building character to start 180 Church. I believe 180 Church will be, if not the most impactful Christian ministry in Manhattan and New York, because it will not focus on, and let me tell you what I've learned in the last five years. Number one, I will not give my life to consumers. I will not, and people go, Pastor Sam, you should, you know, plant a church here in LA or here, and it will be huge. I, I'm not going to preach, and I'm not going to give my life to a bunch of little Christians coming in. How come you don't sing Hillsong's worship? How come you don't sing Passion's worship? How come you have that guy as the worship leader? Why don't you have more people on the worship team? Why don't you have, you know, why don't you preach more different type of sermons except sin and tell me I'm effed up, tell me I'm good? I've learned the last five years that I am no longer afraid to lose people or keep. It's not about numbers for me. I am not going to give my life to a bunch of little Christians telling me how they want it and how they want to consume it and how the preaching is like this and the worship is like this. I hate those people. I don't want to build a consumer church. There are tons of churches like that. How you just come in for the worship and the message, and if it's pleasing to your taste, you go, it was good. They deserve my presence. I will. My prophetic position of the past 180 churches is to slap the stupidity off those people. Bitchify them so that they would wake up. And because, listen... I, I can give my life, though, to a bunch of believers that would believe, like Xavier, to use everything they have for the, to expand the cause of Christ. Amen? I can give a thousand years of my life to that atheist that came into our church and telling me, he told me the first day he came, I'm only here because my friend invited me, and I didn't want to be rude. And I, I want to just tell you something. I'm not easily convinced. The Bible is just another perspective. How do I know which perspective is true? And then after two weeks, three weeks, I feel, I feel goosebumps. <laughs> and then one Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, Right after one of the messages, he walked two blocks away from the church contemplating about what the hell is going on with him. I'm a party-going atheist pagan. What the hell am I doing at church at 10 a.m.? Why am I? And he said, I don't even know why I'm coming. My body moves. <laughs> he said, I don't believe in God. And one block away from leaving 180 Theater, he said he, feel, he felt the goosebumps again. And God was saying, I'm here, and you know it. And then he beats up his friends, six of them, calling him in the morning. He goes, you guys are coming to church. They're like, why? Dude, we party hard last night. Matt tired. You coming. And then I see these other atheists coming to church, and I ask, you know how I ask people to raise their hands? Right? Normally, when you're, atheist means that you don't believe God exists. So when I say raise your hand to surrender to God, you don't raise your hand. Then you'd be, raising, you'd be surrendering to nothing. And you see these four atheists raising their hands, closing their eyes, <laughs> and praying t to no one. <laughs> and I bet you they were on the verge of feeling those goosebumps. And surely God's presence was in that. Let me tell you, I can give 1,000 years of my life to not a consumer, but to a person that never heard the message of Jesus Christ. That's what I can give my life to. That's just what 180 Church is about. That's the very heart of everything we do. Every, everything we do is about giving that person without a chance to hear the gospel. One time to hear the message of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That's who we will be. Let me tell you. Let me just tell you from January What's today? Fourth? Third? I forget. Fourth? All right, January 4th. 
Don't invite anyone to any church that already goes to church. We don't like them. If they go, yo, I want to check out your church, tell them no. We don't want you to come here. They go, why not? We don't like you. Let me tell you, Christians that come to one any church, uh, let me tell you, I will never, Christians come to one any church, they go, you know, and this is the question you ask to a Christian. So, what do you think of the service? That's right. That's right. The worship is right. What's up with that guy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, sermon, sermon was amazing. No. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was good. I, I could feel it. I could feel it. Let me tell you. I don't want to hear that crap. I, I don't want you to critique me. I'm not here for you. Now, when you ask uh, someone that's unchurched, that doesn't go to church, or that's broken, or been hurt, how many people know someone that's been burned by the church? Say amen. Burned by the church, not going to church, atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, what the hell, whatever they are, except Christian. You're like, well, that's weird. Isn't it church for Christians? No, church, it's, we're the church. We're supposed to go out. I want, when you ask an agnostic or a non-church person how the church service was, and then they say, it was interesting. I want to hear that. I want to hear many interesting stories about how, I didn't know a guy like that sings at church. He has a CD? Cool. Because he has nothing to compare it to. No Christian music. <laughs> No, Chris Tomlin. I mean, their first Christian subculture will be Amin Lee. <laughs> so they have nothing to compare it to. Why is his voice not like Chris Tomlin? Why come he doesn't sing passion songs? I'm like, and they'll be like, wow, a movie theater, huh? Uh, stand out, well, what is this? You guys mean in the basement? What else is going on here? I mean, I want to hear stories like that. I want to hear stories about people that are not consumers that just want to come and take and take and critique and not be the church. I don't Tell those friends that, no, 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 I don't want you to come to my church. Don't even invite them. If they go to church, let them waste their life. Or let their, let their pastor disciple them to do something. Because let me tell you something. This church is about mission. It's about reaching people for Christ. I want the most pagans of pagans coming to the church. I'm, I'm talking about like heathenist. I'm talking about half-drunk, lost people in, in, in the alley of the club. I'm talking about like passed out, throwing up on himself. I want that person to come to church on Sunday. And then I want them to sit in the front and go, hey, you threw up yesterday night? You had a good time? He's like, yeah, I guess. I want those people to come to church. I want people that have been hurt by the church, lost by the church, not ever been to church to be here to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you something. If we can have a church like that, you will see the most powerful movement of God you've ever seen. And that's why I believe one a church exists, is to reach the unchurched. So, if you have a friend that hates the church, great, that's the people we want. It means that you have to work. Uh, invite it, come on, let me just say, I'm, we're going to give stars for people who run a church now. <laughs> Tiffany might win, but... <laughs> but uh, you get no star for inviting. Because inviting a church person to your church is like cheating. That's just like, oh yeah, I'll go to church. I'll check it out. Forget that. We want, the, we want 180 to be a place where when people walk in, they, hear, they get the goosebumps. They hear God. God calling them home. And that to be the main thrust of what we're about. Amen? So let's commit our lives in this ear to that. Let's all stand and pray together.